I've supported thousands of people to launch their luxury camping and glamping businesses across many countries around the world. And in that time, I've had a few common questions. One of those is what glamping business models are available to me? Now there's a lot of confusion about this. Yes, it's not about the structures and whether you'll be offering teepees or safari tents or anything like that. And it's not about the actual structure of your business and whether you're going to be an LLC or a corp or an ink or anything else. This is something completely different and I want to share it all with you today. This is episode three. Welcome to the Glamping Americas podcast, the place for inspiration about the business of upscale camping, glamping and luxury outdoor guest accommodations. I'm Sarah Riley from the Glamping Academy and I'm working with my friends at the Glamping Show Americas to share everything you need to know about new trends, events, business models and investment potential in the rapidly growing world of luxury camping that delivers an experience interest in this industry is exploding so if you want to be the first to find out what's hot and what's not subscribe here and check out the show notes for more exciting news and links and be sure to add the next glamping show americas to your calendar for the 3rd and 4th of october near denver colorado and i'll see you there i can't wait Right, well, I'm really excited to get involved in this one with you today because there's so much confusion about this. I've had so many people ask me, so what glamping business models are available to me? I want to set up something. I want to set up something in the industry and I really don't know what I can do. Well, I can tell you there's so many. And actually, as I always say as well, the only limit is your imagination. It's just incredible. Now, it's not about the structures. Yes, we have teepees, we have bell tents, safari tents, cabins, wagons, tree houses, and more. But that's not what the business model is. Now, obviously, your structure can determine the season length that you might have, how much you can charge guests and how expensive your business will be to build. So obviously, you need to consider that in your business planning and everything else. But that's not the business model. Instead, the business model will determine if it's a good idea in general, if it will be profitable and if it will cost a certain amount of money to set up. So I'm going to go through a few of them now so that you understand the tiered system that exists. So there's three tiers. The first tier is all about the type of business model you're going to go for. And determining this at the beginning is really important because this will take you down a very different path. It will definitely sit differently with your lifestyle values and goals and everything else that you've got in mind. But I'll explain more in a minute. First of all, I'm going to go to the second tier. The second tier is all about the style, the style of business that you want to set up and how it's going to be generally uh, inviting business, finding guests and also giving you some kind of profitability. Then there's tier three and this is the implementation. This is your business model and how you're going to implement it. And knowing these three tiers for you and what it means for you and your decisions about how you're going to set up your glamping business model is essential for understanding how you're going to work and how you're going to set up your business planning in the future. So let's go back to tier one. So tier one is all about that kind of higher level view, that umbrella view of exactly what you're going to be thinking of setting up and the model around that. So I'm talking about whether you're going to go for a franchise model, whether you're going to go for a larger resort style model, or whether you're going to be a kind of small or medium enterprise. Now, of course, the choice is completely up to you, but each decision will take you down a different path. So if you haven't listened to episode two, go back to that and try and figure out exactly what you want to come out of this. So what your lifestyle goals are and where you want to end up in the future. So when you're in this place of understanding, you can think about the franchise model. So franchise basically summarizing it, is where someone else has done most of the hard work for you. 
you are basically investing in an established brand and systems that have already been set up and tested, they've proven success, and they can prove that to you. And while this is great because it saves a lot of time, you can hit the ground running, you can definitely get ahead faster. You will need to definitely like the brand you're investing in. You need to like their ethos. You need to be sure that they have success and they're going to be able to share that success with you. Some people also don't like the fact that they aren't going to be very creative in the process. So they don't have to think of a brand or a logo or a name or graphics or anything like that. People do like the graphics and the branding and everything else, even if they're working with an agency, it's a really lovely process to go through. It's almost like you're giving birth to a business, something that you can be really proud of. So if you are thinking of doing franchise, obviously there's a lot of due diligence that you need to do to make sure that that franchise company is actually able to deliver on what they say they can deliver on because actually you're going to have to invest quite a lot of extra money into the business that they have already set up. So you're buying their systems, you're buying their brand, you're buying the right to be able to trade under their brand name and everything else. So it's really important that the due diligence is done very thoroughly and that you understand the monthly fees that they're going to be asking for, whether they're going to be asking for a share of your profits. There's obviously lots of different franchise models and you need to know that whatever model that is that you decide to invest in, if that's what you're thinking of doing, you'll get a lot of support throughout that process. A lot of training, a lot of staff support and understanding how you're going to be able to enjoy the same level of success that the franchise company is offering. So of course it goes without saying that you need to like their model, but also you need to know the lease period for the franchise any penalties for maybe pulling out and also having an exit plan because at the end of the day you need to know that you're building something that's going to be of value to you but if it's not how do you get out of it without any negative outcomes. As we know sadly businesses don't always work out so making sure you're protected in that whole process is essential and of course, there will be lawyers who will be able to take you through that process and advisors because the franchise model is very unique. And there are definitely benefits to getting involved in it, but I think also quite a few negatives. So make sure you make a good decision. If this is the kind of business model you'd like, there are quite a few franchises available in the glamping industry. So keep your eyes peeled for them. So the next one on this tier is resort development. So this is when we're looking at larger investment, multiple partners, there's more staff involved, there's more of a need for additional revenues to be, in, to be generated because of the business model. There's kind of an ascension model style going on, there's risks and there's also rewards. However, it's worth noting that permissions are harder to obtain because local authorities often get a little bit worried about the size of a resort. And the same can be said of local people who often come together and they start petitioning against a resort coming into an area because obviously glamping businesses want to be where it's rural and where it's beautiful and local people in that community don't want to have the additional traffic and footfall, people, noise, pollution and everything else that a resort, if it's not run properly, if it's not managed well, can bring. So there's a lot of fear involved in this and so there's a lot of concern about big resorts and this can delay whether the resort gets the permission that it's after. There are ways to avoid all of these negatives but on the whole, if you're thinking about a bigger resort development, you need to think about the fact that there are risks and there are rewards and no doubt there will be delays. So the next one on this tier is a small medium enterprise. So that's what I know it as. It's known in the US as the Small Business Administration, SBA, which classifies a small business according to its ownership structure. 
Some people call this the moms and pops model. So a model where individual couples and families who have land or want to buy land and want to diversify it can look at the lifestyle goals and they can leave corporate servitude and they can set up a small scale uh, business, a glamping business, often with very little or no experience of business itself and very often with no experience at all of glamping or hospitality. Now if anyone was to ask me what was my favourite one I would have to say it's this because it's just so amazing to watch people go from a dream to reality that has such a profound impact on not only the business owners but their families and I love that. And actually, I love the fact that they are mums and pops. I love the fact that they are people who are coming together to try to generate something beautiful in their area. With this style of business owner, they often have smaller budgets. Maybe they have less knowledge about the topic, the industry. They sometimes have conflicts between family if the land is jointly owned, which it often is. And they sometimes have conflicts with a job. Maybe they have to work a job alongside what they are planning to set up as a, as a glamping business, as a new business. And they have to juggle that and keep that going before they're in a position to jump ship and put all of their energy into their new business idea. So this can often be a bit of a conflict. But it's incredibly rewarding and life-changing without a shadow of a doubt for those involved. So tier two is all about the style of the business. Now I'm not talking about the styling, the interior styling, the exterior styling, landscape styling or anything like that. I'm talking about the style of the business and basically how the business is going to be generating the majority of its income. Now there can be quite a mix of these different elements. It doesn't have to be just one or a few. It can actually be many of them. And I found in my time in the industry that the most successful places really diversify this tier into their business model. And they use a number of them. They use them at different times of the year, different seasons when maybe different travelers are coming into the area or their customers have different needs. So they actually design it around the area and their customers. And that's definitely one of the most successful ways of achieving it. So for your business model, you can design this around events wellness. Wellness is huge in the US at the moment. You can look at sports. Maybe there's a huge sport that's taking off in your area. One that immediately comes to mind is pickleball tennis. I mean, this is huge. Everyone's doing it. And actually designing services around people who have this interest, they like meeting regularly and taking part in sport. Well, when they're going into different areas and doing different things, they need somewhere to stay. They need somewhere to hang out, to have a communal area. So there's ways of designing your business model around that. Then, of course, there's learning and education. Everyone's learning, everyone's doing courses and bringing new skills into their life and their business. And if you specifically want to work with businesses, then you can think about corporate services and certain hospitality that really suits them. One trend that's huge at the moment is based around the fact that many people are working from home because since the pandemic, lots of people are no longer going into the office, certainly not every day of the week like they used to. And corporations are understanding that this is having a bit of an impact on team motivation and team knowledge and skills and everything else they may naturally gather when they're in the workplace. So they're starting to look at different corporate events and corporate hospitality so that although people are working away in their own separate areas, away from the main office, they are coming together regularly to do kind of team building and knowledge building and ways to keep everyone motivated and happy in their work. Then there's the boutique hospitality model. This model is smaller and it's upscale. So it's a bit higher end. Maybe the prices are more because what's being offered is more. There is an example within the hotel industry. So have a look at autograph collection by the Marriott and you will see the style of thing expected for a boutique 
offering. Now it's really interesting, this is something that can work really well in the glamping industry because although glamping is traditionally seen as something which is a camping alternative, actually it can be seen as many things including wooden structures, cabins, high-end, unique places, very niche and that it is tailored within a brand that people really want to be a part of. And this is what drives people to book. And this is what drives the prices. Because the supply is less and the brand drives the demand higher, this means the prices can be higher. And it means that they book out quicker. The great thing about this is if someone is running a boutique service, they need to have less customers to make the same level of income as a smaller and less boutique service. So it works really well. This was the style of business model that we decided to go for in the UK and we ran it for a decade and it was very, very good. The only thing that I would say that is a real pressure is keeping that five star review. You actually want to be aiming for the seven star because otherwise, if you don't have that, then you're not really boutique and high end and you can't charge the prices that you want to charge. So it's really important to keep focusing on the level of your service and keeping it high end. The other business model we're starting to see more of in the style of is adults only. So this is without children, this is for people who they may already be part of a family and have their own children but they want to get away from the noise of a site where there's lots of kids running around. That's fair enough, you know, some people want to do things around activities, romance, whatever it might be. And although this business model does actually cause a little bit of conflict, it actually is very popular and seems to be growing in popularity as people are really valuing their time away from their home environment particularly because they are often working at home. And so they want to get away from all the noise, all the distractions, they wanna get away from home, and they want some quiet time away from family, their kids, and other people's kids. Now, I can't go without mentioning the model or the style of model, which is all around the vocation. So diversification of a business that already exists. So this might be farming, fishery, it might be an existing bed and breakfast, traditional bricks and mortar business, it could be a farm stay, it could be something that requires supplementary accommodation. So they're adding on glamping and a glamping style offering to accommodation that they already have. And this might be to diversify, to get a little bit of PR, it's great for generating PR. And also just to kind of look at other ways that they could attract a different audience into their area or get some other customers at different times of the year. Or maybe, as in some of the clients I've worked with, they have got a lot of business during the months of July and August and it's incredibly quiet the rest of the time. So they are looking at how they can build on accommodation and accommodation offerings without breaking the bank so they're not having to invest in bricks and mortar and it means that they have a huge number of rooms available to their large market which only happens at certain times of the year. Another business model style can be entirely set around the lifestyle needs and desires of the owner. So something that comes to mind for me based on somebody I've worked with in the past was when somebody actually wanted to leave their city jobs, they wanted to move into the countryside, they wanted to grow their own food and become sustainable, they wanted to chop their own wood and create their own heat and do everything else that they needed to be able to run their home life without having to rely on the grid. So on the normal utilities that most people plug into. And they also wanted to homeschool their children in a wild setting, a free setting, so that they can actually enjoy nature and enjoy running around freely and they would feel that their children are safe for having an abundant life. So they wanted a business, a business model that would build around all of this so that the business was actually secondary to their personal family needs and their lifestyle needs. They had become really disenchanted with how things were going in their lives so they just decided 
that's it. We're going to walk away from this. We're going to build ourselves a new life and we are going to use glamping as a business model to help us do that. And we are going to offer it in a way that suits our lifestyle. And they are incredibly successful and very happy and their children are running wild and homeschooling. So it definitely works. Okay, so now we're gonna move into tier three and this is all about the implementation. So this is how are you gonna make it work? How are you gonna make it happen? Once you've got a handle on the type of business you want to set up and the style of business you want to set up, you can then look at how you're gonna make it happen. And this is where tier three is really good because it can give you all those different options. You don't actually have to own land to make this happen. In fact, I know many people who are working on the process of launching their businesses and they don't own any land. They are working with landholders. They are working on pop-up sites. They are working on mobile units and they are looking at temporary permissions to allow them to operate in certain areas. So this is something you can do. You can also just look at maybe hiring the equipment. So you're not actually running a hospitality business, but you are providing the equipment to make it happen for other people. And this can be something that is on a temporary basis, you deliver and take down at certain times of the year, and this allows them to operate, which allows you to operate as well. So obviously there's lots of different costs involved, lots of different agreements and negotiations to happen. You know, I get so many questions from people who want to set up a leasehold deal with a landowner to actually set something up on their land. And really it very much depends on your personal situation, their personal situation, expectations. But I would definitely say that one thing to consider is to build in a profit step process. And this means that as your business becomes more profitable, the landowner gets more reward. And what this does is it really gets the landowner invested in the success of the business that's going to be operating from their land. But don't forget to include a no competition clause. Otherwise, you might find yourself in a bit of a pickle when they kick you off their land and they set up in competition with your business. So there's lots of things there to consider, but obviously having your own land is the perfect scenario. You own the land, you own the asset, you can do whatever you want with it as long as it's within the permission rights of the local area of which they vary. But it means that you can really be creative. You don't have to consider the landowner and what their needs are. And you can really set something up in your own style and you can trial things, you can change things and it just gives you a little bit more creativity and flexibility. But if you don't have that, and if you don't want to get involved in lease deals with landowners, you can think about pop-up sites. So I've seen a lot of successful cases where glamping businesses have set up a hotel type structure where they have the units that they provide for certain things like festivals and events, training retreats, corporate events, and so on. And so they are just in charge of providing glamping, but it pops up on different sites at different times of the year for different purposes. There's also the mobile sites. There's lots of glamping structures now which are on wheels. They look fantastic. We've got the tiny home movement in the US, which is incredibly successful. And it's an ad adaptation of that. So it's using those amazing structures and turning them into a business. So as I've mentioned before, all of these require different sets of permissions. Each area is different. They require different costs. So the setup costs are different to your running costs and your cash flow. And these are all different depending on the business model that you want to pick. 
but also it's about what you want. Remember your lifestyle, your lifestyle dreams and what you want to do, that's important too. So you really have to get a grip of what that is for you and what it is for your family. And when you start from there and then start considering the business models that might be able to fit around what you want to do, then that's when the magic really starts to happen. That's when you start getting really excited about the potential of this industry and where it can take you. And that is why we are seeing so much growth in this industry today. But what makes a business successful? What makes an owner successful? And why is it some people really succeed while others fail? What is it with the owners that succeed that really makes them fly high? What are the different elements that make that happen? Well, in the next episode, I'm going to be talking about the different elements that bring success for a glamping business. And I'm going to be asking the question, are you heading for glamping business success with what you're doing? So I hope you can join me for that. That's going to be a great one. And in the meantime, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review and let me know your thoughts about the podcast so far. And if you have any topics or any questions specifically that you want us to focus on, on the podcast in a future episode, do that too, leave that too, let me know all about it. I wanna answer your questions. I wanna give you the information you need. So until then, take care, bye bye.